Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's with great pleasure that I welcome you all here this evening to the second in our series um, of Grand Challenge Lectures uh, hosted by the Institute, uh, Keels Institute for Liberal Arts um, and Sciences. It's great to see such a, a diverse audience here and actually such a large audience. It's fantastic to be able to fill, uh, uh, fill this room uh, for tonight's uh, lecture. The audience is diverse. I know it's made up of undergraduate students, it's made, made up of researchers, academics, it's made up of friends of Kiel from the wider community, uh, which brings people together around the common theme of some of the grand challenges, the grand scientific and societal challenges that face us um, uh, both in this country and wider internationally. The ethos of the Institute is to bring a fresh approach to our thinking is to be provocative and be disruptive in our thinking, um, and hence the title of the Grand Challenge Lecture uh, Series. The title of tonight's lecture is Why Today's Sustainability Narrative Isn't Working. Kiel has a, a long history of sustainability. Many of you may have come to Kiel for this very reason. You may be undertaking an interdisciplinary, sustainably focused degree, or you may just have a personal interest in that area um, uh, you, you yourself. Kiel has both educational and also research um, uh, uh, um, aspirations in the area of sustainability. And recently we've had um, uh, some very exciting news regarding um, a large investment into our sustainability agenda in the area of smart energy. Many of you in this room have been involved in that very um, exciting uh, uh, venture. We know that the UK, um, as other countries do, face huge ca challenges in their, their, their mission to successfully decarbonise our energy systems, ensure a su secure supply of energy that's affordable for consumers, and in meeting these challenges also provide new business opportunities. And to answer these crucial questions, the university has recently secured a £15 million investment in a new project that will allow the university campus to become uh, Europe's largest single integrated gas and heat smart energy network demonstrator. It will also be the first facility in Europe for at-scale living laboratory uh, developing and demonstrating new smart energy technologies um, and services in partnership with business, business and industry. This is a very exciting adventure for the university and provides a really substantive source of investment into the university's sustainability uh, agenda. As a university, educating future generations and driving research into sustainability and the environmental agenda, we could not be better served by our Chancellor, uh, Jonathan Porritt, who is tonight's speaker. He took up his office at Kiel in 2012. He is an internationally renowned environmentalist, an author and commentator on sustainability. He is hugely respected for, globally for his work on sustainable development and is an inspiration to our students and staff alike. I'm delighted to be welcoming this evening to the Institute to present him to the Institute to present tonight's Grand Challenge lecture. Jonathan first got involved in environmental issues in 1974 when he taught in a West London comprehensive school for 10 years and from here he moved to become director of the Friends of Earth uh, where he stayed until 1991. In 1996, he was involved in setting up the Forum for the Future, and he continues to be involved with this organisation, which is the UK's leading sustainable development charity and a growing presence in the US, India, Hong Kong, Singapore and Malaysia. Jonathan has undertaken a number of strategic roles, Director of Friends of the Earth, Co-Chair of the Green Party, and for nine years in 2000 to 2009, he was Chair of the UK's S Sustainable Development Commission, providing high-level advice to government ministers. All told, Jonathan has been working in environmental issues, educating, writing and inspiring and campaigning for over 40 years. And as you can see, um, and you, as you will see from tonight, he is still very much hard at it. A quick scan through his uh, Twitter feeds would suggest that he's very much involved with many of today's contemporary issues uh, in sustainability. For example, understanding how 
the pig revolution uh, uh, is occurring in terms of factory farming and, and commenting on factory farming, thinking about um, uh, Philip Hammond's autumn statement and the implications that has for st sustainability to replacing roof tiles with solar tiles, and so the Twitter feeds uh, go on on this subject. A subject particularly close to his heart and perhaps highest on agenda was recently about the voices of young people and youth and how those uh, voices uh, led the post-Brexit progressive uh, politics that are pervasive um, at the moment. His talk tonight, Time Frame Dilemmas, Why Today's Sustainability Narrative Isn't Working, uh, is very much in line with the Institute's philosophy about provocative thinking, disruptive thinking. I'm sure that tonight that Jonathan will be both provocative and disruptive in his, our thinking, in his thinking, but I'm sure also constructive in the way that we approach the issue of sustainability. So it really is with great pleasure I welcome tonight's speaker in our second of the Institute's Grand Challenge lecture series, uh, uh, Jonathan Porrett. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, always dangerous to invite me to be provocative and disruptive. Um, but since you have done so, I will, I hope, live up to that invitation this evening. It is a very, very auspicious evening for me to be giving this lecture. I think when I first came to Kiel as sort of chancellor in waiting, one of the first things that I was told about was this incredibly exciting new project that Kiel was involved in, a smart energy demonstrator. And I thought, whoa, that sounds like exactly the big project, the big, ambitious, leadership-driven project that a university like Kiel really needs. And I just want to take this opportunity to congratulate all my colleagues here at Kiel who have been working away at this, certainly for four years, because it was 2012, as you heard, when I first started to get involved, probably for longer, and it is brilliant that today is the day when this was announced, that it becomes a reality, and it will certainly help shape the leadership ambitions of this university over the next few years. So it's a really, it's a really good day for Kiel, a really important day as a demonstrator of our own commitment to a low-carbon world. And honestly, I'm glad that we have an entire lecture series about grand challenges that is entirely appropriate for the Institute, but there is no possible challenge grander than that of learning how to live sustainably on the planet. It is impossible to imagine a bigger, more stretching, more daunting target than reinventing this whole notion of progress for humankind so that we end up actually being able to sustain life for our species indefinitely into the future, which at the moment we cannot actually guarantee, which is pretty extraordinary when you think about it. Now, I've been doing this work for 45 years. That's when I first got involved in environmental issues, just after the first UN conference on the environment in 1972, when I read a book about blueprint for survival, about what we had to do to change the very essence of what we meant by progress to make it possible to sustain life on Earth indefinitely. 45 years. So I was at a very different university yesterday, York University, and I got asked a question there by a student. They said, are you still in a position where you can be hopeful about the future? And it made me reflect on whether I was ever asked that question 45 years ago. And to be honest, I never was. Maybe that was the arrogance of youth, relative youth, in those days, but it never occurred to me that there was a hopeless situation looming. There was a situation looming where we wouldn't actually be able to use the genius of the human spirit, our inventiveness, our creativity, our capacity for compassion to create genuinely sustainable futures for the whole of humankind. It just never occurred to me in the early 1970s that we wouldn't be able to make this one work. 45 years on, I ask myself that question with increasing frequency. Is it any longer legitimate 
to be hopeful about the future of humankind? Is there genuinely some resourcefulness, some source of hope that we can draw on. And I'm extremely grateful to a group of students that I spent some time with this afternoon where we touched on this whole notion of hope and how important hope is providing a foundation for us to continue to act as agents of change. And I want to kind of look at that in my lecture this evening. In one respect, what we're dealing with is something as old as the hills, which is the competition between short-term issues, problems, difficulties, firefighting stuff, and the need for long-term perspectives, planning for how we grow and develop over a long period of time. Some cultures are better at this than others. China, for instance, has very long time frames. People tend to think in civilizational time frames in China rather than in long periods of time. We tend to have incredibly short time periods here in the UK and in many other countries. It was always that kind of dilemma. So there's nothing new about that. But right now, nearly 20 years after a period of huge acceleration in human numbers, in economic activity, in corresponding impacts on the natural world, what is sometimes called the great acceleration in our industrial society, we now have to ask ourselves that question. Does the short-term mindset of human beings today have such a hold on our brains that we can't actually plan for a better, longer-term future? Has it literally reduced our capacity for sensible, longer-term thinking? And there are all sorts of reasons why you might suppose that to be the case. When I was growing up many, many years ago, it is true, there was still something called deferred gratification. Many people spent much of their working life anticipating that there would be a time when they would eventually be able to benefit from all those years of hard graft, which they put in early on in their career, so that they would eventually end up in a better position than they were at the start. Deferred gratification? What the hell is that? For young people today, that's quite simply gone. Nobody thinks about that. Everybody thinks about pretty much everything pretty much now. And if there is a reason to defer anything, it's because you can't afford it now, but you will be able to afford it later when you get a bit more money. Secondly, we live in what is called a hyper-connected world. Everybody, by virtue of the device, just very close to most of your hands, if not your hearts at this very moment, everybody <coughs> is connected pretty much to everybody and everything else in the world today, instantly. So we have that hyper-connectivity connecting us all the time. Thirdly, as another example, there was a time when people would think about investing capital on what was sometimes called a patient, long-term basis. There's a phenomenon called patient capital. Much of that has been replaced now with the phenomenon known as high-frequency trading where there are people who make literally billions of dollars by investing their money for literally nanoseconds in the movement of a particular stock at a particular time. So what we are surrounded by as our cultural context, if you like, is a situation where things become ever more short-term and the long-term seems to have less and less influence on how we do our business. So this is problematic. And when you try and think about reasons to be hopeful, as it were, you have to work harder these days than we used to have to work back in the 1970s. The last time I asked mis uh, myself that question, do I have the right to be hopeful in the world today, was not a good day. It was the day on which Donald Trump <laughs> became the future president of the United States. By one of those really utterly miserable juxtapositions, it was also the day on which I finished reading one of the most impactful books I've read for a very long time, written by an outstanding climate scientist here in the UK, a man called Peter Wadhams. This book is called Farewell to Ice. 
And Peter is one of these scientists who have pretty obsessively been studying one particular part of one particular big ecosystem, in this case the Arctic, to see what is happening to the sea ice in that part of the world. We get little snippets of news about the disappearing sea ice, about how every summer there's just a little bit less sea ice than there was the year before, about how we're seeing much less of this solid, what is called the multi-year ice, building up now in the Arctic. About how every year more and more of the ocean area is exposed to incoming solar radiation, what is called the albedo effect. When you have open water, it absorbs the incoming solar radiation. When you have bright, white, crisp, icy terrain, it reflects the radiation back out into the atmosphere. So the more water you have, the more energy is absorbed. And the more ice you have, the more is reflected safely, happily, back out into the atmosphere. Because the sea ice is disappearing, the albedo effect, the reflectivity of the water in the Arctic area is getting less and less every year. And this leads to a very complicated set of phenomena, feedback loops, in that one particularly vulnerable, complex ecosystem, where the difference between a short-term phenomenon and a long-term consequence is being narrowed all the time. So as Peter Wadham says, what we're looking at today in terms of the melting of the Greenland ice sheet can be described as a very long-term phenomenon. Even he, who is pretty apocalyptic in his predictions, acknowledges that it may take another 60, 70, possibly 100 years for the whole of the Greenland ice sheet to disappear. But there will come a tipping point possibly in the next five to ten years, where we won't be able to stop that process even if we wanted to. So the only time frame we really have to worry about is what happens in the next five to ten years. Because after that we will have triggered a set of feedback loops in that system which will make the melting of the Greenland ice cap absolutely irreversible. Whatever we did however effective we were in limiting the emission of greenhouse gases. Just to remind you, the whole of the Greenland ice cap is the equivalent of seven meters of sea level rise. Seven meters of sea level rise, just in that one ice cap. Forget the Antarctic ice caps, I'm not going there today, that's even gloomier, but just Greenland, seven meters. So here we have an extraordinary situation where we are contemplating, where we're happily trucking along from day to day, more or less hoping we're okay because a few climate scientists will tell us, oh yeah, it'll take 100 years for the Greenland ice cap to melt. Well, that might be true, but that is not the figure that we should be focused on. The figure we should be focused on is what is the point at which that melting phenomenon becomes irreversible however long it then takes for the effect to work its way through during that time. Now, I'm using this story about the Arctic because, of course, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin have very significant shared interests in the Arctic. Most of their shared interests, it has to be said, are about the convenience of the ice disappearing because it will permit increased exploration of fossil fuels in that part of the world and increased shipping as the Northwest Passage opens up and suddenly companies will be able to move goods and services through the Northwest Passage with huge savings in terms of where they have to send their vessels at the moment. That's pretty much the only thing that Putin and Trump care about the Arctic. The fact that the sea ice is disappearing fast enough to liberate huge new commercial opportunities. So we have to kind of step back from this a bit and we have to recognize now that we're living in 
a very different and really very dangerous world. And that is what I want to focus on now. Four or five years ago, a wonderful author called Naomi Klein wrote a book called This Changes Everything, and by which she meant that the accelerating phenomenon of climate change, the worsening impacts of climate change on the lives of ever greater numbers of people every year, that that phenomenon changed everything, as in the expectations we might have about improvements in our economy, in our ability to go on remaining as creative and resilient as we are today as a species. Well, I have to tell you this evening that the Brexit vote and the election of Donald Trump in the US election also changes everything. Because these two extraordinary shocks to the political system of the UK and the USA respectively means that we can no longer take any comfort in the model of sustainability which we have embraced and stuck to, often with dogged obstinacy, over the last 30 or 40 years. And I, I'm one of the most dogged and obstinate adherent to that model of sustainability that you can imagine. So from this point on in my lecture, understand that I'm basically attacking myself for the failure to change, to evolve, to transform our model of what we mean by sustainability so that we might just conceivably have avoided these two quite dramatic, game-changing shocks to our political system. So what is this sustainability narrative, as I call it? What is this idea about sustainability that has held decades' worth of environmental and social activism going for a long time, going back to 1972, or some would take it further back to Rachel Carson's book in 1968. What is this model of sustainability that has essentially empowered people to act in the name of sustainable development throughout that time? Okay, so I'll lay it out very simply. Firstly, that it is wholly proper for everybody, whatever their political persuasion, to seek to improve the lot of humankind in whatever way they can. Essentially, a continuing commitment to a model of progress that was initiated right back at the time of the Renaissance. It is proper to pursue that model of progress by using the faculty of reason and complementing the faculty of reason with a sense of compassion. Compassion for those in this world who do not have the benefits that those in the rich world might have. And that this balance of reason and compassion would essentially be the mechanism by which future progress could be assured over the next few decades. When you think about reason, we have basically bought into the idea that reason is underpinned by science. And when you think about the institute that we're celebrating here tonight, the liberal arts and sciences, essentially these are the two complementary elements of learning that Kiel is now seeking to bring together in this institute. Reason, science, and I'm going to fudge this one a little bit, but a sense of humanitarian compassion for other people in the world today. That commitment to science essentially says that scientists out there on the front line or beavering away at their computers, whichever it might be, will surface enough evidence to allow policymakers to use that evidence to improve the way in which our societies are regulated, are governed. So the policymakers take the evidence, use that brilliant science, and turn it into equally intelligent, progressive policymaking for the betterment of humankind. Now, that doesn't provide all the answers. We know there are still very difficult trade-offs. We haven't done a particularly good job, for instance, on equity issues. We somehow ended up in a world, in the rich world and in the poor world, 
where there are literally obscene differentials in wealth between the richest and the poorest. We've done an absolutely appalling job on guaranteeing minimum levels of equity in our economies. And we've done an even worse job in terms of securing the entitlements of future generations as we wrestle with all of our own short-term problems today. Not a bad sustainability narrative to use good science to bring forward policy-based interventions in the workings of our economy and society to secure a better, safer, more sustainable world for the whole of humankind. Not unreasonable, you might say. Pretty good. Certainly kept me ticking over for decades of my life. Seemed to me a, a pretty sensible way of doing it. That narrative, honestly now, is more or less useless. Post-fact, post-reason, post-compassion populism now rules in two of the most important nations on this planet, in the UK and in the USA. Any notion of evidence-based policy has pretty much been set aside. Any notion of compassion for those less well-off than ourselves is somehow seen as detrimental to securing the well-being of those two nations. So we have to adapt. We have to think this through logically. You can't go on with a model that is demonstrably ineffective. We have to work out the implications of what that really means for us who are passionate about the notion of sustainability. So from the perspective of climate change, or what I'm going to call climate politics, just take stock of the similarities between what happened in the Brexit vote and what happened in the USA. Just think about many of those here in the UK who utterly, mendaciously, so on a completely dishonest basis, masterminded a referendum campaign. They are mostly climate denialists. From Nigel Farage to a bevy of conservative grandees who spend most of their life today trying to weaken, to dilute the consensus around climate science. Trump and all his principal supporters are climate denialists to a man. And I use that word advisedly. Now just think about this. Trump might reasonably expect that he will have eight years as president. Most presidents hope they will be re-elected for a second term. That takes us through till 2025. This is precisely the window of time, precisely the window of time, if you listen to Peter Wadhams and other climatologists and others on the front line of climate, this is precisely the window in which we have to make the decisions which will either secure a reasonably good, just, decent, secure future for humankind, because we avoid the phenomenon of irreversible climate change, or we don't, in which case we end up in a more and more disrupted economy and society in which that process of climate change leaves us all infinitely better off than we are today. That's the window. Eight years. That's it. And who's the most powerful man in the most powerful nation on earth? A climate-denying populist. There's a second equally compelling reason why these two seismic shocks have changed everything for people like me. If you think about it, it's just never going to be the same again, really, because our conscientious, carefully constructed, often quite articulate call to action on climate change is now basically a busted flush. 
It is seen by those populists in America and here in the UK as an elitist, inadvertently insensitive grand plan that continued to ignore the needs of the poorest people in the UK and the USA. The left behind, as we're now invited to think of tens of millions of people in our two countries who have benefited little and sometimes not at all from 40 years of untrammeled neoliberal kleptocratic capitalism, which essentially has served the interests of precisely those self-same populists who now have taken full advantage of the situation to claim to be tribunes of the people, to protect those people against conventional politics and against the likes of us who've argued this story about climate change. If you look at what the advocates of Brexit and the advocates of Trump as the best man to be the President of the United States have been saying, they portrayed middle class climate activism as yet another attack on the working poor, as yet another way to disparage, to condescend, to patronize those who perhaps didn't feel the same way about climate change that we did. So here's the first, in my opinion, now inevitable change in the narrative in terms of climate politics over the next few decades. Either we recognize this new political reality for what it is, or we stick to a business plan that we know doesn't work. And trust me, the Brexit votes and the election of Donald Trump are definitive evidence that a certain model of addressing these big issues doesn't work. So let me spell that out a little bit more clearly. Winning the climate war, I call it that advisedly because that is what it now is, depends almost entirely now on addressing the direct economic needs of the left behind, of the poorest people in our rich nations, disgracefully, immorally poor still, in two of the richest nations on earth let alone those poor in developing countries who've yet to go through the same process. Now, this is a complex thing. Climate campaigners have often talked about what is called the just transition, transitioning from fossil fuels to a different energy paradigm in a way that doesn't harm the already poor, in a way that doesn't do further damage to those who haven't benefited from this model of economic progress. But in essence, in our own countries, it's mostly rhetorical. When people have talked about the just transition, they're thinking mostly about small island states in the Pacific that will disappear way before sea levels rise by seven meters. They're talking about poor people in poor communities already dramatically affected by climate change. But we don't somehow think about the just, just transition in our own economies today. We don't prioritize the needs of the poorest communities in our country or the needs of the poorest communities in the USA. But we could so easily do that if we just change the narrative a little bit. We could prioritize the rollout of solar power, for instance, so that it went first and foremost to support better lives in the poorest communities, not to make life slightly better for those who already have the privilege of living in quite well-off middle-class communities. We could help often poorer rural communities to take the advantage of this new approach to energy generation, to end up with more secure economies and communities. We could at long last deliver on our endless promises to retrofit the disgustingly poor quality housing that many people still live in in this country and in the USA. We have to prioritize the application of low carbon technologies and economic opportunity to those who might describe themselves today as the left behind. If we don't do that, it is extremely unlikely that our narrative will have any more impact over the course of the next eight years 
than it has had up until today. Interestingly, in the Sustainable Development Goals, the wonderful set of 17 big global goals signed up to in 2015, there's one phrase that binds all the 17 goals together, and that phrase is, no one left behind. Fascinatingly, that terminology was used with the SDGs long before the Brexit vote, long before the US election. But that's the story. How do we make this transition work so that no one is left behind? It's not just a UK or US thing. We have to get a lot smarter about this all over the world. We have to think about policy in completely different ways. And I'm very happy to get into some discussion about what that might mean. For instance, think about the millions of people today who are still entirely dependent on the mining and the burning of coal in different countries, in India, in Indonesia, in South Africa. Millions of people who would have no livelihood at all if those coal businesses were arbitrarily closed down without any transition strategy for the people who work in them. We have to get real about issues like that. The World Bank has to start funding complex transition strategies to enable those people to move from one energy economy to the next energy economy. In Indonesia, where I've done a lot of work over the last four years, I'm pretty disgusted by the fact that nearly a decade's worth of high-level, enthusiastic Western debate about helping to prevent deforestation has ended up with diddly squat actually being spent to help poor communities stop turning to their forests to eke out a pretty miserable existence, frankly. We talk ever so eloquently about reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation, the red agenda. If you're a poor Indonesian subsistence farmer today, they are likely to turn around to you, as they have to me, and suggest that I should stick my red where it would really hurt. They've only seen no benefits from this debate whatsoever. And yet we say to them, sorry, you can't use your natural resources because we're now so worried about the emission of greenhouse gases from the burning of your forests that you're going to have to stop, even if that means that your lives become even poorer and even more miserable than they are today. How does anybody think that can possibly work as a model of transitioning from one economy, one energy economy, to the next? It can't work. It's just not possible. So for me, these things become pretty palpable, pretty difficult, pretty immediate in the way we need to change the narrative of how we do this. But please don't think I'm going soft on this whole story. I'm really not. It is actually time to fight back on this whole question about whether we are right to call people like Donald Trump climate denialists. Now, we're going through a really weird period here in the UK, and I can assure you, having spent the last couple of weeks with a number of deeply traumatised colleagues from the United States, they're going through an equally weird period of soul-searching, of recrimination, about how did we as right-minded, progressive, compassionate, liberal citizens, how did we let these political shocks happen? How could that have emerged in our lives at this stage? And one of the things that's going on, and you can understand why, is that those on the progressive left here in the UK and those in the progressive liberal movement, means something different in the US, as you know, the liberal tradition in the US, both are now beginning to question whether or not we should ever have used the language of climate denial. Was this so offensive to people that somehow it provided extra sucker to those who were saying that climate change is still scientifically unproven? And who are these liberal, often middle class, climate change activists to say to poor, left behind communities in the US, in the UK, 
that they are climate denialists. How does that ring with those communities? And what I've seen is like so many flagellant penitents we're now going around whipping our backs because we used terminology that was seen to be deeply offensive to some of those people in the left behind communities. Okay, so let's just spell this out. There are different kinds of denialism going on in the world today. And we have to start with the systematic, totally dishonest denialism as practiced by the likes of Donald Trump. I can say that categorically because I have read and reread the text of a letter that Donald Trump sent to the US president in 2009, urging the president at that time to let America lead the world in terms of its technology and its power to help other nations into a low carbon future. So 2009, Donald Trump, fully signed up, business leader, loving the accolades he got for being a low carbon leader in the US business community. Eight years on, Donald Trump now completely reverses the situation, the position, the rhetoric, the language, and continues, despite rather haphazard denials about this, continues to say that climate change is actually a scientific hoax perpetrated by the Chinese to destroy the US economy. Please don't think this is being done by accident, as it were. We've kind of fallen into the position of thinking of Donald Trump as being a bit stupid. Very unwise, unfortunately, very unwise. This is one smart politician. And why now does it serve him to take a completely different position than the position he took in 2009? For one very simple reason. He is now supported by, funded by, encouraged and exhorted by a whole group of ideologically driven activists in the United States who see that dealing with climate change is somehow antipathetic to the ideological beliefs they have. Why? Because you can't deal with climate change through the market alone. It's impossible. You have to have really clear, purposeful government intervention. And if you're a neoliberalizing zealot, which Donald Trump and all his acolytes are, government intervention is itself the enemy. Equally, and we understand this pretty well, given that we're still a member of the EU, you have to pull sovereignty. You have to give up stuff and some decision-making to higher decision-making bodies to come up with the best policy proposals. Pooling sovereignty and US nationalist, populist rhetoric do not fit. So Donald Trump's denial of climate is not about climate. It's about the politics that he seeks to represent. <coughs> so just understand this and assume for a moment that Donald Trump is in complete command of the science of climate change. I know that sounds nearly impossible to believe, but trust me, most of his advisors are completely in command of the science of climate change and its impact on the future of humankind, and yet still choose to perpetrate a narrative that says that climate change isn't really happening. That's an extraordinary situation, and a quite different form of denialism than that which you might associate with the very large numbers of people, millions and millions of people across the US, and many, many here in the UK, who, if you like, have been persuaded by that approach to the climate, have been led to believe that there's something really elitist and damaging to their interests if we pursue a low-carbon future. For me, the latter, the left behind, should be acknowledged as victims of this climate denial, not as perpetrators of it, but as victims 
of what I call the abuse of denialism. Not stupid, not ignorant, but still distressingly vulnerable to a political conflict of the worst possible kind. Now, to do that empathetically, to do it without patronizing those who are victims of denial abuse is not easy, but it's what we now have to do. So you can see this is not going to be the same story about climate politics that we've had up until now. It'll be the same story about climate science, because science operates in a cleaner, more objective zone. And scientists will go on doing what scientists do, which is apply themselves to generating the best possible insights to natural and social phenomena so that we might eventually make use of those insights to come up with commensurate policy change. That's a huge change to the narrative of sustainability. Now, there are many other ways we need to change the narrative of sustainability, and I'm not going to go through all of those tonight. We have to do brilliant things to make sustainability sexy. I know this is slightly at odds with what I've been saying, but I'm absolutely fixated now about the brilliance of people like Elon Musk, the wonderful Tesla entrepreneur, who, trust me, has started to make batteries sexy. Would you credit that. I mean, if you ask people to sort of list some of the least sexy things in the world, I can pretty much guarantee, if you prompted their response, that batteries would be somewhere in that list. Elon Musk is doing something so creative that he started to make people think about batteries as a woo kind of story almost impossible to imagine. If you don't believe me, look at the latest film of Elon Musk on YouTube, launching not his batteries, which are quite old hat now, they're two years old, but launching his utterly brilliant new solar tiles. Okay, so at the moment it's very simple. You have a roof and then you stick your solar cells on the roof. Bit clunky, not that pretty, really. I mean, I don't object aesthetically, some people do, but let's face it, not many roofs are aesthetically enhanced by the solar cells that we stick on them. So what does Elon Musk do? He says, yeah, well, that's yesterday's solution. What we're going to have now is all of our solar generating capability in the tile. Not stuck on the tile, but in the tiles. And just Google Elon Musk solar tiles, because you will see him in this film strutting his stuff on the set of Desperate Housewives. It is one of the most wonderfully surreal moments you are ever likely to have as you explore the wonders of the solar economy. I won't say more than that. I wouldn't want to spoil it for you. But just think about Florentine tiles and French Provençal tiles, all stuck on these disgusting disgusting, obscene, large American mansions that tell you everything about why America has lost its way and possibly its soul. So, we don't just have to address the issue of equity, we have to do really more exciting things like Elon Musk. And thirdly, we have to make sustainability rebellious. We have to ensure that everything we do uncompromisingly protects the interests of future generations. And I have to admit, this is my principal driver now in my whole sustainability advocacy work, is ensuring that this notion of intergenerational justice is not parked, is not left, because our current circumstances are so difficult, because the economy is in such a mess, because there are so many fires we have to fight on a daily basis, so we'll get round to climate change once we've done all of these other difficult things that we have to address. We cannot do it that way. We have to put the interests of future generations right there, right now, today. So, positive narratives around justice, fairness, excitement, intergenerational equity. It's quite a big change that we're looking for here. But in that discussion that we had today, earlier with a group of students here, I was reminded, quite honestly, that people like me 
and dare I say it, looking at the age range here, from young to old, <laughs> people like you, we do not have the right not to be hopeful. We do not have that right. If we do not remain hopeful, we deprive people of agency, of their sense of empowerment, of their opportunity in their own lives to make a really big difference. And every time I spend a day here as chancellor of this amazing university, every time I am reminded that we do not have the right not to be hopeful. But at the same time, and I guess, Jonathan, this is where I'm going to get a touch provocative in my last comment, we also do not have the right to go on being quite as complacent and quite as semi-detached as we are about the threat of accelerating climate change and the destruction of many aspects of the natural environment as we are today, even here at Kiel. Even here at Kiel. We don't have that right. Ask me a lot. Thank you.